So I hope everyone is well. I'm uh, Alex Herman. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the Assistant Director of the Institute of Art and Law, and I, I work with Debbie on the, on the LLM program, which you've all applied for. Um, and I mean, I think that what I'd like to do in maybe 35, 45 minutes is talk to you about restitution, which is obviously a very topical issue. And at the end of that, I want to draw it into its impact on the art market, specifically with regards to auctions. So that, that's what I, I uh, intend to do. I would like to, to take questions. Um, it would be nice if we could have a little bit of back and forth. So I think use the, uh, the, chat, the chat box. I know there's also the Q&A. Um, you, can, you can use that too, but I think, I think the chat box works, works well because you know, it's very clear to everyone what, what the, the questions are. Um, I'll, what I think I'll do is I'm, I'm going to start in a couple of minutes. I want to share my screen. So I'll just get that set up so you can see some slides. So it's, you don't just have to look at, at my uh, face the whole time. You, you get my face plus some, some slides. So, so it's a two for one deal. Um, so I'll get that set up and then I'll check just to make sure that everyone can hear me. Um, and that there aren't any technical issues. And then what I'll probably do is about halfway through, I'll check the, the chat box uh, properly to see if there are any questions that have arisen. And then at the end, obviously, we'll have the, the, the bigger Q&A session. But I like to do it halfway through just, just in case there are some topical issues that, that we've dealt with in the first part that, that need to be discussed um, shortly thereafter. So if you could just give me a few seconds while I set up um, the... Uh, the um, my screen. I'm going to be sharing it. Uh, Debbie, I can see you. Yes. Hello. Hello, everybody. I will. Um, I'm sorry. I'm late. I thought that we were still having problems. So. Oh no, no, it's okay. I just, I just, uh, I just filled the time with some introductory material, and okay. it looks like that everyone's everyone's here, and okay. uh, some of them have have added that to the chat box, and. Again, I, I express my appreciation to you for sorting out the, the technology and, and the, the email situation, which we won't get into that detail here, but I'm glad yes, we're I'm, working. Uh, yes. Hello, we're, everybody. It's good. All is yes. good. Okay. All, is, All good. is good. So I'm just taking a few seconds to, um, to just set up my uh, screen. Okay. So uh, let's begin. So. The name of the game is restitution. This is a, a very topical issue um, that uh, many of you are probably familiar with. And it's obviously not a game, but I've just, I've just used that, that term. Um, because certainly since President Macron of France made his announcement uh, at the end of 2017 about uh, possible restitution of African artifacts to sub-Saharan African countries, uh, the issue of restitution has really taken off. Now, it's been around for a long time, and those of you who are familiar with Greece's claim to the um, Parthenon sculptures at the British Museum will know that restitution is, is nothing new. That's, that's been a, an issue for at least a generation. But it, it's really starting to become a major policy issue um, in Europe, I would say, including certainly the UK, and in other parts of the world as well. So we're starting to see a real shift um, I don't think we're at the end of that shift because I think a lot still needs to be done, but we're definitely in a new um, era in this regard. Now, what do we mean when we talk about restitution? Now, those of you who studied English private law, for instance, will know restitution as a body of law. Those of you who've studied uh, public international law will know about restitution as a means of redress, uh, as a possible remedy under international law. Now, that's all very good, but you can park those definitions because when we speak of restitution in the cultural sector, we're not using any strict legal definitions. We're not uh, confining restitution to those means of private law or of public international law. It's more a term of art that's used by museums, by people in the art trade, by countries to mean the return of cultural property um, as a result of making amends to a past injustice. So the idea with restitution is that something has happened um, in the past, sometimes the very distant past, 
that we would now consider it a wrong. Not a legal wrong, could be an ethical wrong, but we would consider it a wrongful act today. And we are restituting cultural property to the original owner or custodian in order to make amends for that wrong, right? To, as, a, as a way of doing as best we can to try to fix a past situation. That's usually how restitution is, is understood. A good example of that is, is the return or the restitution of, of artworks that were spoliated by the Nazis in the 1930s and 40s throughout Europe. Um, when those works are returned today, uh, we speak of that as a restitution. In a sense, it's the return of the, of the art as a way of making amends for what had happened in the past. Right? We, can't, we can't bring back the past, but we're trying to use the cultural object as a way of, of rendering justice to a certain extent. Again, not a strict legal definition. It's not something that necessarily everyone would agree to, but that's generally how it's understood. I have uh, those definitions. I mean, the first one, restitution, the overall aim of doing justice for a past or recurring wrong. That's quite a, an important factor. Um, you sometimes hear about re repatriation, which I've included as well. Repatriation is similar, and sometimes the terms are used interchangeably, so it's a little bit complicated to follow. But repatriation is generally similar in that it's about a return, but it's usually about a return to a specific place or community. So if you think of the term repatriation, the patria, right? That's Latin, patria meant fatherland or homeland. So the return to a place of origin, repatriation. The way I see it, restitution is more about doing justice for a past wrong, whereas repatriation is, it's not so much focused on what happened in the past. It's more about where something belongs today. So you could see those as two models of return. And then I have the third definition here, which is just return, a generic term that in a sense includes restitution and repatriation. And you do hear that word used. Obviously, it's a more uh, understood word by, by members of the public. So return would include restitution, repatriation, but it would also include things like the return of, of stolen work of art, right? If a painting is stolen from my house and, and it's returned to me by the police, I probably wouldn't talk about that as a restitution or obviously repatriation, it's not going back to, to any homeland, it's just going back to my, to, my, to my wall. So that would probably just fit within return. So all that to say that you don't need to fuss too much about these definitions, just to know that these are the words that are generally used in the sector. Uh, not one of them holds sway over the others, although restitution is generally what you, what you read about. I mean, including in the popular press and the pages of the New York Times or the Guardian, you'd hear about restitution, that is the term that's used. So now I'm going to take you on a, a whirlwind tour of the history of restitution. We're gonna look from the Roman period all the way up to the present. And then um, towards the end, we can, we can start to look at how it plays out in some of those art market scenarios that I, that I mentioned earlier. So let's start with the Roman view of uh, the spoils of war. So obviously in that period, there was no respect for the cultural sanctity of certain items, temples, whatever they might have been in the territories that the Roman armies uh, occupied. To the victor went the spoils. That was the general practice in Rome at the time. And I have a couple of examples here. I don't know how well you can see them on the screen. Um, the, the one on the left uh, represents the, just enlarging this a little bit so you can see a bit better. Um, the one on the left is, uh, it represents the, uh, the parade of uh, Julius Caesar after the Gallic Wars where effectively all the, anything of, of artistic or religious or cultural value from what is now France was taken from the territory and then paraded into uh, the Roman Forum. So that was very much the practice in the Roman period. Um, and then on the right, that's uh, Titus and Vespasian, the two eventually Roman emperors, when they looted the temple at Jerusalem uh, in 70 AD. So that was the, the taking of all of the, the Jewish uh, artifacts from the, from the temple and then the destruction of the temple. And that's obviously an important moment in the history of the Jewish people because the, the temple was never rebuilt after that. Um, and now, obviously, what you have on that same Temple Mount is the Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock, and that's a center of great 
cultural controversy to this day. Um, so obviously in the Roman period, there was no, there was no thought of respecting the cultural heritage of, an, of another people. There were some voices, Cicero, for example, said that this isn't a good practice, it's not good for the troops, that these things should be respected. But generally speaking, the practice was to the victor went the spoils. Now, we can always draw things back to Shakespeare. And one of the, one of the benefits of studying in England, which I hope many of you do through this program, is that you can always draw things back to Shakespeare. Right? Shakespeare has a source of so much. You can always find something in Shakespeare that justifies one argument or another. Um, and I always like to do it with regards to Henry V. Um, that's a play by Shakespeare. So now we're talking about the Elizabethan period when it was written. Um, but there's a great scene in, in Henry V, Act 3, Scene 6, where one of the English soldiers in a campaign in France during the Hundred Years' War has taken a chalice from a church. So we're talking just a, you know, religious, a cup, basically, from a church. And there's a question of how he should be punished uh, by the king, by Henry V. And some people are saying you should be lenient on him. And he says, no, we will not be lenient on the soldier. He should not have taken it, and he should be executed. It's quite a, quite a strong response, I think, to the taking of a chalice. But that's what, that's what his response is. And what he says is quite interesting. We would have all such offenders so cut off, and we give express charge that in our marches through the country, there be nothing compelled from the villages, nothing taken but paid for, none of the French upbraided or abused in disdainful language. And this is the key, the key phrase here. For when lenity and cruelty play for a kingdom, the gentler gamester is the soonest winner. So what does that mean? Lenity is like lenience, right? So when gentleness and cruelty play for a kingdom, the gentler you are, the better chance you have effectively of winning the war, winning the hearts and minds of the people, right? So that Roman idea that you, that you sack and pillage a place is now fading away. And we can see Shakespeare is kind of pointing to the, to the, to the right direction. That actually, if you want to be a, a, a peaceful occupier, if you want the people that you've just conquered to accept you uh, as their new master, then the best thing you can do is respect their traditions, their heritage, their churches, their temples, etc. So we start to see this coming out through the Renaissance. Um, eventually in the Enlightenment, this becomes a main trend uh, in the thinking of certain jurists. Uh, one of the fathers of international law is Imre de Vatel, who wrote his great Law of Nations, or Droit des Gens, in 1758. Um, he was uh, Swiss, but he spent a lot of time in England, and actually published uh, this, this particular tome in London. And he says, for whatever reason a belligerent plunders the country, he should spare buildings that are the pride of mankind and do not strengthen the enemy, such as temples, tombstones, public buildings, and all other works of art distinguished for their beauty. So we have a similar to what we saw in Henry V, this notion that there's really no need, if you're in an, if you're in an armed conflict, there's really no need to start plundering a church or a temple or even you know, seizing works of art because it doesn't actually help the cause. It doesn't, doesn't make victory uh, more likely for you. In, in actual fact, it probably does the opposite because it would make the population angrier, right? That they have nothing to lose, that they would do anything they can to get rid of you rather than accept you, you know, willingly as, as, as the, the new master of that particular area. So that's, that's the idea. We're not quite seeing restitution yet. Right? We're not talking about what happens if something is taken away and whether it should be returned. Um, for that, we first need to slip a little bit, and that is in the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic periods. Because what happened there was massive taking of works of art, cultural objects, from across Europe, first by the French revolutionaries and then eventually by Napoleon when he became emperor. Um, Interestingly, there's, there's a distinction that's made between looting, which would be what soldiers do if they're let loose to you know, run amok in a, in a town or a city. You know, they break into houses, they take whatever they want. That's looting. That's generally frowned upon even in the Napoleonic period. Napoleon hated looting because he thought it was bad for discipline amongst his troops. But what he did instead is he ensured that in all of the peace treaties he'd enter into with the various states that he had defeated, that they would hand over to the French usually 50 great works of art and 100 manuscripts, 
or in the case of the, the Vatican, it was 100 works of art and 500 manuscripts. So these were all then paraded back uh, to France. And this is the image that you see on the screen, um, which was commemorated in a piece of Sèvres porcelain. There you have um, some of the most famous works at that time, the Medici Venus on the left, which had been taken out of Florence as a result, again, of a peace treaty that Napoleon had entered into, or rather imposed on, on, on the prince of that, of that particular region. And then the Laocon um, from the Vatican Museum on the right, and then in the center, the great manuscript collection of the Vatican Library. So these were all taken, um, paraded, as you see, through the Champ de Mars in uh, Paris, and then deposited in the Louvre, which at the time was known as the Musée Napoléon. So Napoléon actually had his name on the museum where these, where these spoils of war, we could say, were deposited. So that, you could say, well, all that development that I talked about from Shakespeare to Emma de Vattel, the Enlightenment, everything, it seems to have gone by the wayside. Well, no, because when Napoleon was defeated in 1815 at the famous Battle of Waterloo, um, there was a policy of restitution that was imposed by the Allies. And the two great proponents of that policy were actually British. So on the left, you have the Viscount Castlereagh, who was the British foreign minister at the time. And on the right, you have the Duke of Wellington, who was the, the general who defeated Napoleon uh, at the Battle of Waterloo. And they were great advocates for restituting the artworks that had been taken by the French and by, by Napoleon. And we're talking about thousands of works of art in total that were taken. Um, and this is interesting also because the British, in a sense, had nothing to get back because nothing had been taken from Britain by, by Napoleon. Um, but yet they respected the fact that these artworks should be in their place of origin. And actually, the Viscount Castlereagh on the left had said that what Napoleon did was contrary to the usages of modern warfare and of civilized nations. So what the view there was that what Napoleon did was actually contrary to a sense of international law at the time, undeveloped as it, as it might have been. So we're starting to see a real shift. Now we're really talking about restitution and return. And those of you who are interested in this, in this topic will probably know about 1815 and what happened there. And there's some uh, great lectures on the topic uh, that you can watch for free um, from the Collège de France and Benedict Savoy, who of course was one of the co-authors of the report for President Macron, um, in, in 2018, she, she delivered a whole year of worth of lectures on 1815, which she called the year zero for restitution. Right? That's when restitution really as a, as a major policy starts to develop in Europe. Now, we don't see an actual codification of the rule of protecting of cultural property in times of war until 1899 and the first Hague Convention because throughout the 19th century, the rules of war tended to be governed by custom and practice, as opposed to anything codified in black letter law. Um, that changed as of 1899, where finally the states of Europe and a number of other states got together and agreed to this Hague Convention. Now, the Hague Convention covers a number of different issues, um, but there is a specific article that deals with the uh, protection of, of works of art, and that's this Article 56, which I have. But, but the whole convention deals with, you know, the treatment of civilians and, and non-combatants, etc. So there's a lot covered in this convention, but the drafters still thought it was important to include a provision that protects um, works of art and what we would call cultural heritage today uh, in, in times of armed conflict. It doesn't talk about restitution, uh, but it does say that if anything is taken, it should be made the subject of legal proceedings. So you get this idea that there should be some legal mechanism to recover something that has been taken, but it doesn't specifically talk about restitution. Of course, um, you then have the First World War, 1914 to 1918. At the end of that, uh, the Allies uh, entered into a peace treaty, effectively imposed a peace treaty on Germany, uh, famously the Treaty of Versailles. And believe it or not, there are three articles in the Treaty of Versailles which deal with restitution. And it's interesting, and actually a lot has been written about these three articles, because it's interesting how the Allies conceptualized 
restitution? Like what, how can it occur in what situations? Is it always as a result of looting during times of war or could there be other ways in which we might want restitution? And the three examples here kind of each show a different angle to restitution. So that Article 245 is Germany returning to France anything that it might have plundered either in the First World War or an earlier war 20 years earlier. So that's kind of the obvious way you think about restitution. Article 246, Germany had to restitute to a couple of non-European peoples a couple, um, a couple of items that they had taken um, many years earlier. And then Article 247 dealt with Belgium um, and the rest, what they call the restitution in kind um, of items that had been destroyed uh, when German troops um, set fire to the library at Louvain, Leuven in, um, in Belgium. So it was, it was obviously you can't replace those pieces with the exact pieces that were destroyed. So you, you replace them with equivalent pieces, a restitution by equivalence. And then there was also the restitution of some of the panels of the mystic lamb altarpiece from Ghent Cathedral. So that's the famous altarpiece, actually infamous because some people have said it is the most stolen work of art of all time. And the First World War uh, dealt with it um, in the Treaty of Versailles. And some of the panels were in Germany at this time, not as a result of the war, they'd been legally acquired, but the main part of the altarpiece, and indeed the, the home of the altarpiece was Ghent Cathedral, uh, sorry, St. Bavos Cathedral in Ghent. Um, and so part of the Treaty of Versailles was to to restitute what was in Ger the pieces in Germany so that the entire work could be completed, right? So that the entire, all of the panels could be seen together. So another conception of restitution there, the idea that works need to be whole and entire, that if a work is split between two or more countries, it, it, it lacks the artistic integrity that it would have if, if those pieces were reintegrated. Then we get the, the Nazi period. Now, this is a very dark period for Europe, obviously, um, including with regards to looting um, and the, the, the dispossession of works of art. Um, the Nazis did terrible things to Jewish property from 1933 all the way to the end of the war. Um, and then in the occupied territories um, did, did equally uh, negative things with regards to works of art. Now, at, towards the end of the war, the Allies realized that this was something that they needed to do something about. So they created the famous Monuments, Fine Arts and Archives section of the Allied Expeditionary Force, better known as the Monuments Men, aka George Clooney and his buddies like Matt Damon and Bill Murray. Um, and they were created right before D-Day, so May 1944. And as the Allied troops liberated France and Belgium and eventually Germany, um, the monuments, fine arts, and archives section followed them across the territory. Because of their name, you get a sense that the priority at first was not about restitution. In fact, that was only the, la the, the afterthought of their mandate. Really what it was about was first and foremost protecting monuments from destruction during the conflict. Then it was about prevention of looting by soldiers, by civilians. Later, it was about sequestering movable property, protecting works of art, for instance. And then lastly, it was about seeking information on looting and eventually restituting anything that had been looted. When they were created, it, it was unclear exactly the extent to which the Nazis had taken artworks from across the occupied territories, brought them back to Germany and to northern Austria, and then eventually buried them in those famous salt mines of Alto Se. So that wasn't known at the time, but that eventually became the major work that the Monuments, Fine Arts and Archives section accomplished. So even though the war ended in 45, they were around until 1951. And they returned something in the nature of six, sorry, three million objects during that period. So here's some examples on the left, you actually see the Ghent altarpiece. Remember the most stolen work of art of all time? Well, it was taken by Germany as well, and it had been buried in that salt mine in Alto Se, recovered by the monuments men, and then returned to Belgium. And then on the right, you see some of the monuments men on the steps of Neuschwanstein Castle in Bavaria. 
uh, where a lot of artworks, especially those coming from France, had been, had been kept for safekeeping by the Nazis. So those were returned to France. Now, one of the problems um, with the approach of the Monuments Men, and in a sense you can't quite blame them, but it's caused problems even to this day, is that they restituted, absolutely restitution was the name of the game there, but they restituted to states, not to individuals. And if you think about it, three million objects, how on earth could they restitute to individuals? Um, besides the fact that many of the individuals, especially the Jewish uh, individuals, would have perished or would have fled, right? Would be in the Americas or elsewhere in the world and would not necessarily be able to make claims for some of these items in say 1945. So they returned to states. And what that meant in the case of France, for example, is that suddenly all of this art was returned to the state of France, even though it had originally belonged to private individuals. And the reason I say this is still an issue today is you still have within the larger scope of French collections, um, a division known as MNR in French, or Musée National Récupération, which are objects that were returned by the Monuments, Fine Arts and Archives section, but have not yet been restituted to individuals. So they're still kept by the state. Um, effectively, they could be claimed, um, but in most cases, it's very difficult to find out who the rightful owners were, who the heirs might be today, and effectively where they belong. So you realize that the difficulties in dealing with restitution in a wartime context. So the Monuments Men just returned to the States. That was, in a sense, all they could really do in that six-year period following the end of the war. So that's, that's the run-through of, of the history. Um, now we have to, of course, this is a law program, we have to get into some law. Um, I hope that doesn't, that doesn't bore you. Maybe the history is quite interesting, although it is quite sad when you think about it. Um, what I'll do, as I said, I'm going to take a little, little break just to, just to check on the chat box and the Q&A, just to see if anyone's asked any questions. So just bear with me. Okay, so the, uh, the only question I see here in the chat from Zaki uh, would be grateful if you could set out in writing the lectures regarding 1815. I think, do you mean an article or, um, I see what you mean. Yeah, so what I said is Collège de France. Let me type it. The Collège de France is the great sort of institution for French, the French Academy uh, of Learning, and it's uh, Benedict uh, Savoie Lectures. Oh, you're writing it to me only and not to everyone. Oh, sorry, Debbie. Yeah, no, no, no. Sorry to, to everyone. Do you, you could you, Debbie, could, do you mind just copy no, pasting it? I will absolutely do that. Thanks. Thanks for, yeah, sorry yeah. about that. Uh, no, no, I'll do that. Okay, um, so yeah, I think, um, and then I don't see any question, Q and A. Yeah, so stick, please ask questions in the chat box because it's easier for me to see those. That would be great. Okay, so everyone can still see me and we're, we're back to the slideshow, I believe. Okay, so let's look at some international conventions and see what, what, what the international community tried to do about what, certainly what happened in the Second World War, but also what was happening on a more day-to-day -day level in certain countries that were being pillaged of their ancient history. So the first of those was dealt with by the 1954 Hague Convention, and the second problem was dealt with in the 1970 UNESCO Convention. So we'll go through those briefly. Don't worry, it's not going to be too heavy. It's summertime, you're not enrolled yet, so I'm not going to make it too too dry and legalistic, but we just need to know what these conventions did. So, um, the 1954 Hague Convention 
um, was really entered into in the shadow of the Second World War. So it was really affected by what had happened, all of the, the vast spoliation and looting that had occurred across the continent of Europe. It was driven by UNESCO. UNESCO was established in 1945, so right in that important post-war period. And this was the first convention specifically dealing with the protection of cultural property. I mentioned the 1899 Hague Convention that dealt with all the rules of war and it included a little bit on works of art and what we would call cultural property, but it wasn't an entire convention dedicated to the subject. This is. Now it's an interesting convention because it was quite early in that period, 1954. Um, it's generally had wide uptake as of now, but Part of the problem with the Hague Convention of 1954 is it's a little bit vague. I mean, that's usually the case with international conventions because you have to get everybody on board, many countries. It's hard to get everybody to agree. If you've ever tried to draft a paragraph in a committee, you'll know how long it takes to get everybody to approve to wording and language. Um, but it's, it's at least it's an important ethical milestone that you finally have countries, including at the time Russia, or the USSR as it was, agreeing to these rules regarding the treatment and protection of cultural property in times of war. So Article 4 deals with the respect for cultural property and it prohibits the theft, pillage, or misappropriation or vandalism of cultural property. It's not yet talking about restitution though. All it's saying is that that should not happen in a time of conflict. Article 5 deals with occupation, but again, it's, it's a little bit imprecise in terms of what it actually means. Instead, what you had um, at the same time was the drafting of a protocol to the Hague Convention. Now, the reason you have a protocol is that all the parties to the Hague Convention didn't necessarily agree on the point about restitution. And so some of the countries agreed to a protocol and then signed the protocol, whereas the majority only stuck with the convention. So for instance, today, you have over 130 countries have signed the Hague Convention and about 110 have signed the first protocol. So many have signed the protocol, which deals with restitution, that also signed the convention, but there are about 20 odd countries that haven't, including probably most importantly, the United States. They've signed the convention in the Obama years, but they did not sign the first protocol. So the, the Hague first protocol is quite interesting because it's the first international protocol or international instrument that could apply universally that deals directly with restitution. Because what it says is that if any cultural property, and there's a definition in the convention I won't get into, but if any cultural property is exported from an occupied territory and ends up on the territory of a country that has signed the first protocol, that other country that might not have anything to do with the conflict itself has an obligation to restitute to the place of origin. There's certain nuances there, but that's the general principle. So it's placing an obligation on what we'd say are third states, states that are not engaged in, in occupation or armed conflict, places on them an obligation to return things to where they came from. So that's the first time we really see this idea of restitution written, codified, in an international convention or protocol. I wanted to mention this little um, example of how, how this remains an issue even to this day and how these controversies can still arise, sometimes in unexpected ways. Um, this involves the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now the Dead Sea Scrolls, about a thousand ancient scrolls from uh, roughly 2000 years ago that were discovered um, on the banks of the Dead Sea in 1946. Um, interestingly, that part of the mid of, of the, the Holy Land uh, was the West Bank, right? So that was originally occupied by Jordan, and then after the 1967 war was occupied by Israel. Because these, these manuscripts are so important for the history and understanding of the Jewish people, they were taken out of the West Bank and brought to West Jerusalem in Israel proper, we could say, and then placed, eventually placed on display at the Museum of Israel, where they are to this day. Some of you might, might have seen them. Um, 
this has been a rumbling dispute between Jordan, to a certain extent the Palestinian Authority or Palestine, and Israel. It came to a head in 2009 when 16 of these scrolls were sent to Canada for an international exhibition at the Royal Ontario Museum. And the Jordanians and the Palestinians said, well, hang on a second. Canada has signed the first protocol to the Hague Convention, which talks about restitution. Israel has signed the first protocol to the Hague Convention. Jordan has signed the first protocol to the Hague Convention. And even Palestine, because it's a member state of UNESCO now, has signed the first protocol to the Hague Convention. So all the, all the countries at play here have signed this protocol, which says that material needs to be returned if it's been exported from an occupied territory. Now, there are all sorts of complications there, how we define the terms. This never went to court, any court, including the International Court of Justice. Um, but it was, it was a claim brought through diplomatic channels. So Jordan and Palestine tried to approach the Canadians diplomatically. Now, at the time, the Canadian administration was very pro-Israel, so obviously was not going to do anything about it, and obviously was worried that if they returned them, then this would be the last you know, major exhibition of this nature to be held in Canada. Who would want to lend things to Canada if Canada was returning them to their place of origin? So very co big contro controversy, but the end result was that it fizzled out because there was no diplomatic will. But it shows also the, the interplay between law and diplomacy, that sometimes there might actually be a legal argument. You try to resolve it through diplomatic means and it might ultimately fail. It also shows just how important the Hague Convention and that first protocol are and how they can impact things even today. So if you think of material that has been taken out of occupied territories that might end up on the art market, that in theory could be covered by, by the first protocol. Again, it would depend on which countries have signed it, but, but generally speaking, you have over 110 countries that have signed the first protocol. So that can have an impact. Now I want to turn to another context for looting and restitution, and that is the illegal excavation of usually antiquities taken out of usually economically deprived territories and countries and then brought to the art market, usually in the West. So this was the problem after the Hague Convention and the first protocol. This was the problem that really uh, preoccupied UNESCO for a long time, certainly throughout the 1960s. Um, it was really bad for Italy, Greece, um, countries in Southeast Asia, countries in Latin America, South America, and countries of the Middle East, right? These were places that were effectively getting looted, not by soldiers, not in times of war, but by tomb raiders, by illegal excavators who were then taking things out, secreting them out of the country, and then eventually getting them onto the to the art market. So what can a country of origin do to recover something that has left its territory and ended up on the territory of another state? It's very difficult, and those of you who've studied private international law will know that usually state A will not respect the export laws of state B. So just because something has been illegally exported from state B doesn't mean that state A is going to return it. Right. State A might say, well, you know, state B has its own laws. We don't need to respect those. Right. We, we, we have our own rules of of legal conduct within our own territory and very limited ways in which we recognize foreign laws. And that's not one of them. So that was that was the thinking for a long period of time. And the reason you have the need for a convention is that a convention is obviously going to assist cooperation between states to ensure that in that situation, state A does have a legal obligation to return uh, material to state B. So you get the 1970 UNESCO Convention it comes out of that. Um, I've put the title on the screen. It's a very long title, typical of international conventions, where again, you have a lot of different states trying to agree on things. It usually means the text is very vague and the title is very long uh, because everyone's trying to fit something into the title. So I, I won't even say the whole title. I've said it so many times, I've gotten very tired of saying it, but you can read it on the screen for yourselves. And I'm sure many of you already know about it, so I don't even need to repeat it. 
um, but we'll call it the 1970 UNESCO Convention. Um, and it does, part of what it does is it places obligations on states of destination to restitute in very limited circumstances, cultural property that has been taken from states of origin. So it tries to fix that problem that I talked about, the, you could say the private international law problem. It has 140 states as of today, so generally wide uptake, a little bit like the Hague Convention. Um, the, the key article I think I, I would focus on for the purposes of restitution is Article 7b. I'm not going to repeat it uh, verbatim, uh, but what it says is that states of destination, it's usually going to apply to them, will have an obligation to recover and return anything that has been stolen from a museum, monument, or similar institution from another state. So it has to be cultural property stolen from a museum, monument, or other similar institution. It also has to have appeared on an inventory of one of those institu institutions. So if you think about it, it might sound, might sound good, but if you really think about it, it's quite limited because what it doesn't include would be material that has been unlawfully excavated because that's not coming from a museum or an institution and it's certainly not on any inventory. So it's really only going to apply to stolen property. And in many cases, you could argue, well, stolen property, there generally is a recognition that you can't get title to it in, in many countries, not all countries, but in many countries. So it's quite, it's quite a limited uh, feature, restitution in the UNESCO Convention, even though today it's talked about as this great milestone uh, for the principle of the respect of cultural heritage of other nations and eventually the restitution thereof if it's unlawfully removed. But it doesn't go so far as to say anything unlawfully exported from a country of origin needs to be returned. So it's quite limited in that way. Interesting history of the UNESCO 1970 Convention. Um, it didn't have a lot of support initially from market states. And this was one of its shortcomings. And as it happens, I just wrote a blog post yesterday on this, which I've indicated here on the Institute of Art and Law website, because today, or this year rather, is the 50th anniversary of the UNESCO Convention. So we can look back and we can see its development over five decades. And what we notice when we do that is that in, its, in the first half of its existence, so until 1995, the only major supporters of the convention were source countries. You know, countries like Mexico, Ecuador, Egypt, Mali, countries that had been, you know, had a lot of their cultural heritage taken from them and were trying to recover it. Now, a convention like this doesn't work if you just have those countries signing on to it. You also need what are called market states to sign up as well, because then that cooperative element can work and then the market state can maybe engage in potentially restituting the relevant object. Um, so in the first 25 years, other than Canada, US, Australia, um, and even, even those implementations were, were not that effective. Canada and Australia are not huge art market countries, so that didn't have a major impact. And the US implemented the, Hague, or the UNESCO Convention, but only in a very limited way. So the way the US operates, a state, would need to enter into a bilateral agreement with the U.S. in order for its cultural heritage to be protected coming into the U.S. territory. So it's a bit more limited than, than the other ways that the convention has been implemented. Things started to change around the year 2000 because you had uh, Japan 2002, the U.K. signed up in 2002, Switzerland in 2003, so major art market countries are finally agreeing to sign up to the UNESCO Convention. So we're starting to see a real sort of paradigm shift around that period, the early 2000s. And that's what I wrote about in that, in that blog article yesterday. So I recommend reading it just to give you a more detailed idea of what, what has happened in the last 25 years of the UNESCO 1970 Convention's existence. So as it stands today, pretty much every major art market location would at least nominally be covered by the UNESCO 1970 Convention. And as I said, even though the restitution provisions are relatively minimal, 
it's had a huge impact on the ethical landscape. It's had a major impact on museums, on their codes of ethics, and it's had a, a certain impact, not as big, but a certain impact on the art trade as well, on dealers and dealer associations and the rules that they will now respect. So things are very different from where they were in the 1960s. And actually things are very different even from where they were in the 1990s. Now I think what I'll do is I'll end on two more recent examples just to show you uh, what can happen in the art market, especially in regards to claims for restitution. So two examples, one from Sotheby's, um, this was a sale in 2018, and then the one on the right from Christie's in 2019. So the sale from Sotheby's 2018 was of a Bronze Age uh, Greek artifact uh, that was owned by a, a trust, but effectively by a family known as the Barnett family in the US. Um, and they advertised this for sale, they estimated about 150, 250,000 US dollars. They get a letter from Greece. Greece saying, we want to know more. We believe this has been illegally removed from Greek territory and we do not want you to sell it. And we're informing ourselves and we might bring a claim for it. So what do you do as an auction house? What do you do as a major art market actor in this situation? Well, Sotheby's, they withdrew it from the auction a couple of days ahead of time. And then they talked to the consigner, so to this family trust, the Barnett family. And they decided, together with the Barnett family, to sue Greece, believe it or not. So Greece was being sued, and what Sotheby's and the consigner were seeking was a declaratory judgment from the New York courts that the Barnett family trust was the legal owner of this particular artifact. They effectively wanted to clarify the ownership situation through the courts. They wanted to use the courts to do that. Now, that might sound a little bit unfair to Greece, because Greece is now being sued in New York court. At the first instance, the judge said they had a right to be sued because what Greece was doing was having an impact on the commercial activities of another party, namely the Barnett family and Sotheby's, right? What they were doing was having, it had a commercial impact. And that would allow a foreign country like Greece to be sued in a US court. Now, the recent decision is from the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, which overturned that decision. And this was just last week. So it's a very interesting decision. It's Barnett and Sotheby's v. Republic of Greece. So you can uh, find it uh, online. And, and it's been written about in the press in the last few days as well. So that overturned the decision. And what the Court of Appeals said was that Greece was a sovereign, foreign sovereign entity. And unless a foreign sovereign entity is entering into true commercial activity in the state of New York, it cannot be sued. And here, Greece was not engaging in any commercial activity. It's not as if they were entering into contracts and negotiating sales here. They were asserting a sovereign right to Greek cultural patrimony in the state of New York. And that is not a commercial activity. That is a sovereign right, and therefore the rights of the sovereign state are respected under U.S. law. So therefore, Greece could not be sued, and that lawsuit had to be thrown out. We'll see if it gets appealed, but that's, that's the status of it today. So interesting to just to see, putting aside the legal arguments, which are quite interesting, but quite specific to foreign sovereign immunity rules, interesting to see just how the art market actor, I'm thinking of Sotheby's here, how they operated. They withdrew the item from sale as soon as they got the letter, okay? And then they turned around and sued the claimant in the US courts. So keep that in mind, that's one option. The other option is, is what Christie's did last summer. They were selling uh, an Egyptian artifact, the head of Amun, god Amun, in the style of the King Tutankhamun, Pharaoh Tutankhamun. So it's quite a, you know, because of the fame, fame of King Tut, this is an important piece, uh, was uh, uh, purchased in the end for 4.7 million pounds. They got letters from Egypt this time. Egypt instructed solicitors in London to potentially bring a claim. What Egypt had said was that this had been stolen from a temple at Karnak in the 1970s. 
what Christie's had alleged in the provenance report prior to the sale was that it had been in a European collection since the 1960s. So already you have a disagreement on the facts of when this item left, left Egypt, but you notice that it's all around that 1970 date, right? Egypt is saying this was looted post-1970, and then uh, Christie's saying this was removed from Egypt pre-1970, so we don't have to worry as much. We don't have the, the ethical challenges that we might have if it was removed post-1970. So you, again, the 1970 date is quite important there. But what did Christie's do? Unlike Sotheby's, they did not withdraw the, the item. They proceeded with the sale. So it was sold, as I said, sold for 4.7 million pounds, and nobody knows where it is now, right? Purchased, and the auction business, of course, is very opaque. We don't, often don't know who the consigners are and certainly don't know who the purchasers are. So we see two different approaches, both you know, engaging in maybe problematic ways with the question of restitution and, and how they deal with claims relating to restitution. And I think on that point, I will conclude. So now I'll give you a chance to busily write up your questions in the Q&A section. So while our attendees are busy writing up their questions, Alex, um, just in terms of your blog and what you've just written about uh, the UNESCO, do you think it's come far? Do you think that there has been a major, a major uh, change? since it was implemented such that it was well worth the effort and that it is making a great impact? Um, I think it is in a what we would call a soft law way. So it, it hasn't, if you, if you actually follow the, ex the claims that have been made under the 1970, like legal claims internationally, there are very few. You could probably count them on one hand. Um, nevertheless, the trickle-down effect it has had on the sector, especially with museums. I mean, you will not find a major museum, at least in a Western country, that does not at least have in its code of ethics some sort of respect for that 1970 date, meaning that anything that was removed from its country of origin after 1970 without proper documentation will not be acquired by a major museum. That, I mean, that's, that's in theory. So at least you have on paper, you could say it's lip service, but in some ways it, it is followed and that is respected. So that's had a big impact because that means that museums will not acquire this material, which then has a, a, a knock-on effect on the art market because then that's one major source of purchasers that just is no longer available. And so you still have, you don't have that kind of control over private collectors, but at least the major institutional buyers um, will abide by that 1970 date. Even though it's not a legal requirement, they will do it through their codes of ethics, which ends up having a practical effect. Thank you very much. And there is a question if you'd like to take a look at the chat. From Zaki. So Zaki, hello Zaki. Um, so this is a question about the dispute resolution methods. Very good because we have Debbie De Girolamo, expert on dispute resolutions. Me with my two cents on the convention. Um, it's an interesting question. And then what, uh, have there been any successful claims made under? The pro, okay, um, I might start with the second part first. The problem with uh, claims under the convention is that the way Article 7b is drafted, it says that states will claim back cultural property through diplomatic means. Okay, so they operate through diplomatic channels, which in a way you could say for a, from a dispute resolution perspective is maybe a good thing because it means that it's more conciliatory, it's not as adversarial, right? So it will mean that a minister of culture, let's say, uh, 
makes representations to it to the embassy that you know this particular piece was was stolen from our museum and we'd like it back um, but it's not as good for those of us trying to better understand the development because it means we don't have necessarily public records of this you may get lucky and there might be a press release but the press release is not going to say a lot so it's very different from if there's if there's actually a claim that goes through the courts where you can see exactly what the process is and know about all of these claims so no one has actually gone through and made you know an, an, an official tally including UNESCO of all of the items that have been returned under the 1970 UNESCO Convention because many of them are done basically through backroom channels as for the first question on dispute resolution methods under the 1970 Convention interestingly there's not anything specific on what happens if there is a dispute between parties the, there's a general article towards the end which says that the parties would have the ability to go to the International Court of Justice right so that's the sort of nuclear option let's say but it's never happened and it's probably unlikely that a con it would never be taken to that extent by by a country claiming back uh, an artifact Debbie I don't know if do you have any thoughts on dispute resolution in international level yes. or any thoughts yes um so that there is a 1978 sorry is my camera on yeah uh, yeah. yeah it is okay so there is a 1978 intergovernmental committee um, again a very long long um, title and it's basically um, there are UNESCO rules for mediation so um, the title is the 1978 Intergovernmental Committee for Promoting the Return of Cultural Property to its Countries of Origin or its Restitution in Case of Illicit Appropriation. And it's adopted in the 2010 Rules of Procedure for Mediation and Conciliation. Uh, so there are mediation rules um, promulgated uh, according to uh, the auspices of UNESCO and um, the so there's a whole body of procedures um, for that now it it is though run state to state so it's tied in with what Alex spoke of regarding the diplomatic channels so states can make use of the mediation procedures and then, of course, there's a whole gamut of uh, dispute resolution procedures available to parties, um, not even inside of UNESCO, but uh, procedures that are available to parties to try uh, outside of court. So uh, negotiation, uh, good offices, um, expert determination, their arbitration, arbitrations uh, has been used. So the, the one that comes to mind is the Altman uh, arbitration with uh, Austria regarding the Klimt paintings. So there's, there are a whole host of methods that can be used outside of uh, the UNESCO mediation rules. Um, you can even use mediation that would not necessarily be tied to any particular organization like UNESCO or uh, WIPO ICOM um, has mediation procedures in place as well. Um, anyway, so that's just a little glimpse. There's a whole host of uh, procedures available in addition to litigation. And negotiation seems to be a very, very popular one. All right, um, many of these disputes are resolved through negotiation, whether it's negotiation through diplomatic channels, whether it's negotiation through good offices. So I'm thinking about Machu Picchu and Yale, where you had um, involvement of a senator to bring the parties together. And then um, through negotiations, they, uh, you know, they, they resolve the deal. Um, or just direct negotiations, museums entering into negotiations with, with parties. Um, so there's a lot of that. Anyway, um, over to you. I'm curious, 
Well, Debbie, what do you, what are your thoughts on those last two examples I used of Sotheby's and Christie's? There didn't seem to be any, no, I mean, no. they didn't even really try in either case. Sotheby's, you know, sued Greece and then Christie's sold the, the piece anyways. So I yeah, don't wonder what your thoughts are on those. Yeah, it's interesting because oftentimes what does also happen and we don't get the benefit of the knowledge because the one thing that everyone must remember is that when we're talking about dispute resolution outside of a court system, you are going into the private sphere. And as a result of going into the private sphere, unless it gets into the media somehow, unless it's reported somewhere, unless the parties have agreed, we often don't hear about what's happening. But from my discussions and from my knowledge, um, sometimes what the auction houses do, they actually act as mediator, facilitator between the parties. So although they are representing the seller, right, they're aligned to the seller and they also have their own interest that they would like the sales to go forward. So it's not mediation in a strict sense, please. Uh, you know, I'm, for all of you who are listening and watching, that's not mediation. But they facilitate behind the, behind the, the closed doors and they, they often try to, um, uh, try to resolve the dispute between the seller and the, and the claimant. So there is often um, backdoor, backstage negotiations going on, or dialogue at least going on. Um, and sometimes there isn't, like Christie's and Sotheby's. What's interesting on the Christie's, Christie's goes ahead and sells, and Egypt didn't take steps to bring an injunction. No. Right? So Egypt had that opportunity to bring an injunction. So, you know, to, to go to court and to seek an order preventing the sale. And what's interesting is that um, it, it didn't do that. And so then Christie's was free on behalf of the seller to sell because there was no, there was nothing in place to prevent that, which is interesting. Okay. Uh, it's I think it's possible that for those those countries of origin, they realize that they might not have a strong, a strict legal case. And so they write these letters, they, they go to the press, they make a big fuss about things in the hopes that the auction house will negotiate something with the, you know, with the seller. Yes. But in these two cases, both auction houses didn't want to do that and they just you know they acted unilaterally one way or the other um but they resolved it on their own yeah unilateral right one one did the unilateral right yeah. and and they weren't facing any any impediment to acting unilateral unilaterally and the other one decided to take it to court which was interesting yeah, um, yeah. i see that our time is uh, we're you know, coming up to 1015, and I think there was an hour for the session. Um, there's one more question, Alex, if you want to take a look. But before we, um, we answer that, uh, are there any other questions that anyone would like to put to Alex or to me uh, before we revert to that last question? Anyone? Alex? So... I, I did notice there's another in the Q&A, uh, Aaron, Aaron Peck uh, asked, this is more, tech, Debbie, I don't know if you would have the immediate answers. We might be able to answer these together, but it's more about the, just the structure of the program. How many classes do I have to take to enroll part-time in January, 2021? Okay. Is, is there a counselor or an advisor? Sorry, this is all part of the same question. Okay. Is there a counselor or an advisor that I can speak with at the university? And then are classes held at night or on the weekends? Okay, so classes are not held on the weekends. And uh, last year, our classes were held between 3 and 6 p.m. And we are going to aim for that time slot, but on, sometimes timetabling is not within our control. Um, but we try and 
put it to the later part of the day as much as possible. Uh, in term, was there a question on part-time? Uh, uh, yeah, how many classes if, uh, if they start in January 2021? Uh, 2021. Like right January, the, I guess. The program doesn't permit you to start in January 2021. This program you need to start in September 20. Um, it will run for the year beginning in September. But there is the possibility, I guess, for, for them to, to do it on, like from Oh, September, of course. Yes, I'm sorry. Could do it of online. course. No, no, yeah. I, I'm, just, I'm just thinking that. Absolutely. Um, so you have the option of uh, online uh, and then coming in person in January, uh, if, if that's what you would like to do. So there would be online in the first semester, um, blended learning to the best that we're able to do and we don't know what the situation is going to be like with COVID uh, in September. Let's hope for no second wave. Um, there is going to be, an, uh, uh, we're going to try very hard to do blended teaching, but um, it will be online, prim primarily online. Um, and then, oh, and, and someone that they can get in touch with, like an advisor to help them. Uh, the website should have uh, uh, an email address um, for the LLM office administrator. Um, if you've got Petrova's email, for all of you who were at our taster at the beginning of the week, uh, Petrova will be able to direct you. I don't have the email, I don't have an email address right now for me to give to everybody. If you, Alex, if you just take a look at the chat, I'll see if there's another, if, if I can do a cut. Sure, sure, yeah. Okay. So the last question from Zaki as well. Uh, to what extent do you think the convention uh, has been able to correct any existing historical power imbalances between countries when they negotiate on items? Given that many cultural objects appear to reside in the collections of former colonial powers, have there been calls for a more robust treaty that takes into account the demands of former colonies? Uh, very interesting question, very topical. As it stands now, there, there's no treaty or agreement on that. Um, there are certain rules of operation that were agreed to by the UNESCO um, uh, Intergovernmental Committee in 2014. Uh, which you can look at. And what they say, they're not binding, so it's certainly not a treaty of any sort, but they say that when countries are dealing with illicitly removed cultural property that left before 1970, that they should act in a way that is reasonable and respectful of the UNESCO 1970 Convention. So basically saying, you know, countries have an ethical obligation to act appropriately, even when they're dealing with historical removals. Now, that doesn't have legal force. Many countries have just ignored that, and it hasn't really taken off, but it is there. So if you look at the 2014 uh, Intergovernmental Committee uh, rules of procedure, you'll, you'll see that referred to. But you've hit on a very topical issue, especially in the UK and indeed in Western Europe, uh, today, over, you know, certainly over the last few months, it's, it's really come to a head. And so I think we'll see more on that come, going forward. Great. Okay. So I think right. we'll, we'll close up shop. Thank we, you so much, Alex. That was absolutely fantastic. I hope everyone enjoyed it because I certainly did. I was sitting here <laughs> thinking, oh my goodness, I need Alex to do this every September for me. But you're a little, bi you're a little biased though. We're, we're playing on the same team. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. That's true. But we, do, we do hope to see many of you um, either virtually or in person come, come September, October. So we, we look forward to that and we, we look forward to staying in touch. Yes, yes. Um, everyone, have a great summer. Have a really good summer and hope to see you in September. Thank you very much, Alex. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Bye.